Testing. Ah. Kia ora koutou. No mai hari mai tēnei ui. Uh, te ui o awaatanga ki hanga ki temea. <laughs> From the inspiration to the maker to the thing. Yep. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the maker community and how we kind of get makers to engage online and how we get people who are in the online community to engage in the real world, and how we use makers and the internet to create social connectivity. So that's kind of the kaupapa, kaitapai. Cool, uh, I'm Elise, um, I work over at the library. Um, I've been in event management and programming for about 15, 16 years. Um, and in that time, I've worked a lot with a lot of different communities. And primarily, in the early days, you used um, the internet as a tool to communicate what you were doing and try and get people into a physical space so you can engage with them. But we've kind of evolved a bit past that now, and uh, we can actually engage communities really effectively without actually needing to get them into our physical space. So um, we're gonna, I'm quite keen to kind of get everybody's thoughts on you know, makers and how we share what we do and we share skills and all of that kind of thing. So that's what I'm here for today. Kia ora. And I'm Sean. I am in the Digital Programs Coordinator over at the City Library too. I am, run, am running a lot of programs with children with robots and coding and things like that, but then also a lot of practical stuff. So we have the beginnings of a makerspace at the library with power tools and a whole bunch of other stuff um, to encourage people to make. We're just on the edge of getting our plans together for how to get the people safely into the space. So wh what is people's experiences and thoughts of makerspaces? <laughs> I don't know what a makerspace is. Oh, we probably should have started with yeah. that, eh? So, so <laughs> let, let's throw that out to the floor. Can someone answer that? A maker space is a place commonly uh, accessible where people can just do things. So there's tools around, there are opportunities for them to make things. Starts with, I don't know, materials, sewing machines, um, Generally, it's attached to something publicly funded, like a library or an arts center or something like this. And it's been around, the maker movement has been around for at least 10 years. It comes from the States, like everything good and bad does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say as well that on your chairs, for those kinesthetic thinkers in the room, and I think we're all a little bit kinesthetic, um, is some pipe cleaners and paper and stuff so you can make something while you're thinking and um, come up with these really amazing ideas. And um, you can keep your thing that you make if you want to at the end and take it away or you can bring it up and put it in one of the little pots and we'll give it to our um, ringa weirda at the end of the day to say, hey, thanks ringa weirda for cooking all our kai and doing our dishes. Sweet. So any other thoughts on makerspace, people's experiences of makerspaces, what they are, what they do? I'd, I'd probably just um, sort of say they're quite flexible and quite diverse and people set themselves up in spaces to do things for various sort of conceptual and ideological and and social sorts of reasons, generally social, so that the, but the making things Im important for people decide to to come together for for a whole bunch of reasons, perhaps, and that's one of the diverse, interesting things about it. That, that um, yes, that's what. I'm 
That's what I've okay, noticed. So, so is that like people um, needing more than just to make things, it's actually they need a connection as well? Is that what you're... I think that would be something that seems to happen inevitably because even if you just have a wonderful public space next to a library or something because you've got a, a, an, a you know a, a progressive council that wants to throw things up in the air and see what happens I think inevitably you're going to get people just do that thing we're like apes aren't we we like to sort of rub up against each other and talk and <laughs> do all the sort of things that are social and but beyond that important things like organizing whatever you might decide to you know make a space to campaign against poverty as well and use some of your skills to work on a, on a question like that it's um it, it's so yeah it's a little bit like an extension of the library c can be anyway um w i watch kids in libraries in in wellington city and they, they go through phases of coming together in huge groups and they're doing things together um, and it's a really, they look like they're doing something that they really like and it's important. So, And again, that's simply because, say, Wellington City has loads of space now for less about books and stuff and, and for people to come and sit down and group and hopefully use free Wi-Fi and the rest of it. So, yeah. Um, kia ora, my name's Kate. I work at Te Arahuna Community Services and we have alternative education um, where we are. So we would use a maker space if there was one for our youth to come in and just be creative and experiment and it would allow them to um, think about education other than sitting at a desk with a book um, and we would potentially see some... Um, uh, some of them coming alive in certain aspects of creativity that we wouldn't have at Te Arahuna all the time. Um, so it would allow us to allow the youth to express themselves really through whatever medium that would be. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so I want to ask a qu quick cu couple of questions and I want you to raise your hands if this applies to you. Um, who here has a hobby that utilises your hands or a machine to create an object or item? Hmm, most people, very nice. So, w would you like to share about some of those things? So I've been um, sewing since I was a kid and I've never used a makerspace directly but growing up with an artist for a father and um, having a sewing machine available there's something really special about just having the joy of a space where you can go and do something without boundaries and without um, restrictions on what you're doing and you just sit there for a few hours and cut things and fiddle with things. And I think especially in comparison to traditional school curricula where people are um, always on projects that they have to achieve outcomes, it's really good to have those spaces where people can just play with what they're doing and if they fail at something it's not like a failure of a school project it's just oh this project didn't work and let me figure out why it didn't work and what can I do and maybe I'll just chuck it all in the bin and tr start over or etc. Yeah also um, I like the um, I do a lot with fiber and uh, I have my own workspace at home but I love that I have part I'm part of a group we meet monthly to do public stitching and it is just fabulous to do something that normally is done all by your lonesome self to go out and sometimes people stop and say what are you doing and that's just fabulous to bring um, activities that are done solitarily out into the public. Mm. I'm Stuart, I work at the City Library uh, along with Elise and Sean but in a different team uh, and I'd like to say I think one of the things that people need from the makerspace is not just access to the to the tools and the facility but expert knowledge. Uh, we get a lot of people who uh, really want to 
for instance, create a 3D printed object, but they don't really have much of an idea on how to go about this. And at the moment, unfortunately, a lot of people, just due to the limitations of where we were at, they can't actually get hands-on access to the equipment. So they really need staff uh, um, to facilitate that process to make the object happen. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Um, Gunhild kind of jumped ahead to my next question. Raise your hand. Um, if you were part of a hobby maker group or club, just one. Look at that. Okay, who here uses the internet to research how to make new things? Yeah, I don't think I even own a cookbook anymore. <laughs> just <laughs> use the internet to find the recipe I want. Um, who here is a member of an online hobby maker group or club? Awesome. Yeah, cool. So that just illustrates how making is evolving in terms of how we learn new skills as makers um, and how we then can pass those skills on to other people as well. So um, I feel like, you know, with the growth in uh, digital inclusion and, and the way that uh, uh, technology is changing our lives, we're also in a bit of a kind of renaissance arts and crafts movement <laughs> We were starting to really understand how special and important those hands-on maker skills actually are. And we have this wonderful tool called the internet where we can actually preserve those skills and continue to share them. Uh, it was only a hundred years ago, uh, I make taonga pōro, which is traditional Māori musical instruments. And much of my last ten years of making taonga pōro has involved trying to fill the gaps knowledge. Because there's just b knowledge gaps, because there's just been a hundred years of nobody making. And so how do you bring these art forms back when they've disappeared? And we've got these amazing digital tools to ensure that they don't disappear again. So that's important. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of case studies. Um, so I want to know, um, we'll talk a little bit first about online case studies. I'll raise one just to get us started. Has anyone heard of a group called Unlimited? Unlimited. Has it, have any of you ever seen uh, George Clark's um, shed competition? Yeah. So yeah. So Unlimited was featured on that, and uh, Unlimited is a guy who uh, lost his hand as a child, grew up without a hand, figured out in his shed how to use three D printers to create a prosthetic hand that he thought kids would really enjoy, because I guess one of the um, big kind of obstacles for kids getting prosthetics is that they grow out of them so fast that often parents can't afford to just keep buying new ones and new ones and new ones. So he figured out how to 3D print a prosthetic hand that can actually pick things up for children that can be made in 12 hours and printed for $10. And then he shared that information online and uh, he made it possible for people all over the world to either use their own 3D printers to create prosthetic hands for children or to contact him in the UK and he could print them out and post them out. And not only that, he can customise them for kids. So if they want a prosthetic that looks like the Hulk or something, he can do that. So um, it's pretty amazing and pretty fun. Does anyone else have any examples of online maker communities that are doing really cool things? Sorry, I was just trying to look it up and I can't remember the name of it. Um, but there's a guy over in Europe who's um, trying to come up with a solution for plastic. And so what he's done is he's created online templates for all the machinery. So he's created this machinery that um, can melt down plastic and then it can make new things that you can then sell, like clipboards, bowls, stuff like that. So he's pairing up this kind of... Um, solution for all the plastic that we've got in the world with an, a makey space as well so people can go in he's even um, put online some templates of how you can change a shipping container to be able to be the office that you put all this equipment in um, it's a really cool concept actually um, and there's there's a few people doing similar kind of plastic recyclable things within these makey spaces in New Zealand but not as many as we'd I'd like to see 
but that's one idea that they did. Awesome. Okay, so talking about real world makers, um, here in Palmerston North, um, we got approached by a local group who um, had got together because of their love of steampunk. And uh, they came to us because they wanted to sort of make some things and have a space to get together for regular sewing groups and things like that. And so as a library, we provided them with a space. And then uh, we got approached by another steampunk group from Fielding who were sort of saying, oh, we want to do some stuff and we're wondering if, you know, the library can help us out. And then we got approached by another steampunk group from sort of like Tararua Way, Hawke's Bay, who said, oh, we're thinking about coming down and doing something in Palmy. We think you can help us out. And we found out that all of these steampunk groups around the Mutu weren't talking to each other and didn't know that each other existed. And we were like, hey, we need to sort this out. So we kind of hooked them all up and went, hey, you guys, how about you all get together and come up with some cool thing that you can all do together here at the library? So they all joined forces and had a steampunk event at the library, which was absolutely fantastic. It had everything from teapot racing to costume competitions to umbrella duelling to making steampunk weapons and people showing off their amazing hats that they'd made. And seriously, if you haven't seen teapot racing, you need to see teapot racing. It's, it's super like amazing. It's um, ripping apart a remote control car and mounting a teapot on it and decorating it as much as you can and then racing them. So uh, it was an amazing day. And what I absolutely loved the most about it, besides all the like costumes and stuff, was the fact that um, we had seven-year-olds racing teapots all the way through to 78-year-olds. We had 10-year-olds in the dress-up com costume competition right through to 80-year-olds. There was every demographic, every age group represented, and it was fantastic. And not only that, but I met a few people who struggle with mental health and anxiety disorders who said that uh, this was the first time they'd left their house in months and they came out to be with the rest of the maker community and they'd had a fantastic day. So that was a real-world example of getting some maker groups together and breaking down some of that social isolation. Does anybody else have any examples of some real world maker groups doing some cool things? No, okay. Absolutely. I, I joined a code club, um, but as a helper really, so that's a, um, a watched some kids grow up basically f over how fast they do is over a period of a year was um, it's, it's so it provided me with quite a lot of um, interesting stuff since I don't not really work with kids like that um, and uh, so, so I, I, I guess I'm back to this what you know what is a maker thing it, it's just the maker thing it's the way of recognizing that people do things together and make them whether they're tangible and and made out of stuff, or, or whether it's like playing with a Raspberry Pi, where a lot of the stuff is about coding it or what have you. But um, and we're doing it all the time. But, but uh, for but me, one of, one of my experiences has been there's a lot of blurring with it. That one of the things we do with robots um, takes coding on the um, computer. So the children would build the robot, <coughs> be ready to go. They'd start coding. It would start working then the coding would get a bit more complicated. So they'd stop and they'd come back and they'd start decorating the robot. So we're using Lego robots, which are very practical, but then there's a whole bunch of decorative pieces as well. They come back and they decorate and that activates part of their brain or something because they're using the, a different part of what's going on. And then they come back to the coding and they've figured it out. So for me, there's a real blurring there of coding and practical and all of that. Okay, so we just, um, we'll move on now to, uh, I guess, the first sort of discussion point, which is how do we facilitate real world maker groups? And real world maker groups is everything from people who get together to do coding, people who get together to do knitting circles, people who get together at men's sheds to make things, 
Um, these are all maker groups. And how do we get those people who often are very kind of fixed in the real, you know, hands-on world to actually share with and join online communities? Anybody got any ideas? So if we use one example of uh, one thing that we did at the library, we have a craft-noon tea group that come in once a week, two o'clock in an af of an afternoon. They all sit around, work on whatever projects they're working on and have a cup of tea and a biscuit and catch up. It's a real kind of social group of people who like making all sorts of different things. And uh, that's grown over the years. We now have about 30, 40 people who come regularly every week. And uh, so we thought, hmm, while we've got them all in one space, why don't we introduce them to the vinyl cutter? <laughs> and, uh, and we taught them how to use the vinyl cutter, how to use the computer to put up their designs, to get the vinyl cutter to cut their designs and then use those designs on fabric and bags and things like that. And uh, they loved it so much that now they want to come back and do more vinyl cutting sessions and bring more people along, which is great. Um, so that was sort of one example of kind of trying to transition people into using digital tools. Um, but then the next step is how to get them to share those experiences and those skills with other makers, especially when you get really amazing, proficient niche makers who you just kind of think, oh, we really need to capture this person's skills <laughs> somewhere so that we can share them and have them forever because when they're gone, we're going to be like, ah, what do we do? <laughs> so one of the things that I've been getting into over the last couple of years is quilting and especially hand quilting, which um, apparently is a bit weird for a 31-year-old. But, you know... The thing is about quilting, though, that what I find incredibly useful is that you have all of these women who are in their 60s or 70s in the Midwest United States, and they're using things like YouTube videos to demonstrate their hand quilting techniques. And that is incredible because it means that I can learn from those women these skills that have traditionally been passed down from generally from mother to daughter or mother to daughter to granddaughter. And you'd n usually learn those by sitting next to someone and watching them work. And it's like I can use the internet to sit next to them and watch them work and translate it into my own work while we're halfway across the world from each other. And that's incredible. So I think especially with a lot of those traditional maker techniques, really valuing those techniques before they get lost and documenting them and so I don't know if there are communities you know as you said the traditional um, making of instruments or things like that having people able to go out and document the kinds of skills before we lose them so that they're there for future generations to learn from and for other people like me who don't want to go and join a group in person but who do want to sit at home after work one night and learn a new stitch technique. That's incredible, having the internet available to do that. Awesome, thank you. Yes, also I think um, particularly for women in, making uh, in, in the maker community, there's a lot of um, uh, networking going on through Instagram, um, through YouTube is probably more instructional, but also through Facebook groups that you join, you know, somehow you hashtag something and then you find, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I wanted. And then you join that group. Often they're closed groups because they don't want to have uh, negative shit going on, basically. Because these are communities that really, uh, they want to share, um, but they don't want to necessarily be really out there to be judged or so? I'd like to ask you, as a, a young man, like um, your generation and, and people around your age, what do you make of this maker community? And like we were in that earlier session together and I was talking about how I, I think that the rise of the use of digital technologies is 
going to put people out of jobs and going to have to learn how to be self-sustainable and whatnot. Uh, is your generation seeing that or and, and looking at making as an option? To be quite honest, no. Uh, and that's the big issue when it comes to, it's a mixture of the way that a lot of the youth interact and a big issue also with schools. Um, so schools have a very traditional centric where it's focused on more sports and cultural. So the kind of more extracurricular, extramural stuff isn't really there. And it kind of sucks because like, for example, uh, you don't need to go to university to do an $800 paper when a lot of the information's available online through YouTube resources. You can self-teach yourself how to code uh, outside of the curriculum. So the current issue with a lot of schools is it's very curriculum centric and that's also the fact that a lot of schools want to uphold their own reputation. So the concept of outside groups, I mean from my experience, trying to get outside groups within a school that doesn't promote their image is kind of set aside. So unfortunately that's n a big issue. And since we're a more a smaller city, not like Wellington, we don't have that huge vibrancy. And so if, you're, if it's not in the school, you can't really do it as an option. Just to bounce off that as well, I I know I've joked about how, you know, once the billionaires are ruling us all and everyone's out of a job because they've replaced everyone with robots, at least I can make artisanal clothing for people. But I think that's a double-edged sword because there are some people in my generation who really value the, the hand-created items, but because as well you can go to Kmart and buy a $4 pottery bowl, there's a lot of devaluation of the work that it takes to make things by hand. And I think that if you had more um, people brought into these maker communities, maybe people would value more what it means to make something by hand as opposed to, you know, mass produced fast fashion or fast whatever else that you can go to the high street shop and buy. And so it's kind of, Again, it's that difficulty because, yeah, automation will mean that we've got more resources available to us, but, you know, it's all a question of what it winds up, who, you know, what we value. Um, yeah, just to jump in, um, of that, that idea with, especially with the idea with um, kids um, working and, ma and making, um, I work with um, 11 to 13 year olds and a lot of them aren't aware of what you can do because things are quite cheap and easy to get your hands on. Why would I make it myself? Um, I've been trying to put together a maker space at my school. Um, it's a huge challenge. Wow, some um, things have come up that I didn't expect and all that kind of thing. Um, but I was working with some kids in there a couple of weeks ago and we were, um, we were trying to create some electrically conductive paint um, we had just found some instructions online. Um, I really had, hadn't tried it. We thought, let's give this a go, just to make an LED light um, glow. Um, we were mildly, like, kind of, like, in the middle kind of successful, but uh, the kids absolutely loved it. And they said, why can't school be more like this? Why can't we do this more often? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it should, yeah. Awesome. Um, just to give another really good example of a, um, of a maker community translating into digital and then translating back into the real world, um, there's a New Zealand company that uh, is on the cutting edge of uh, creating sustainable textiles. And uh, they're, they're based out of New York at the moment, uh, but they're um, New Zealand founders. And uh, they came across a young student here in New Zealand who had dug out this old 1970s knitting machine from her grandmother's garage and uh, gone down to a local club to learn how to use it and thread it up and all that kind of thing. And uh, she used the knitting machine to create her own textile, print it or, get, you know, program the knitting machine to knit it for her um, and used it as her kind of end-of-year graduation garment and uh, this New Zealand company who's working in, you know, cutting edge textiles in New Zealand went, we'd never thought of, uh, in New York thought, we'd never thought of knitting machines. And, uh, and so they've flown her out for a one year residency with them 
and uh, they're looking at basically overhauling knitting machines as we know it to uh, help us create more sustainable textiles. Um, so that's a another really cool example of just, um, you know, makers who are using these old machines that we haven't used for years, passing it on to the younger generation and then them taking it the next step further and doing something really amazing with it. So did we have any other... Sorry, I just sort of wanted to touch off of that, is that um, weaving machines and knitting machines were really where programming began, because that's how people, they programmed jacquard looms with punch cards, which are then how computer programming began. And so I think it would be really cool for schools or whatever else to um, loop kids back in and show them how programming a knitting machine is similar or the same as programming code and get people interested in it that way and see what the tangible links are between those things rather than having this, um, I guess, like a dichotomy between it's online, it's digital, it's code, it's STEM work, it's completely, you know, gender segregated and it's traditional, it's maker stuff, it's, you know, doing stuff with your hands and that kind of thing. Okay, so if we go the reverse way and we look at how do we get some of those people who are quite active online, um, looking at YouTube videos, maybe joining chat groups and online maker groups, maybe, you know, like some of the people that we encounter with the Steambunk group, they have some social anxieties or they have some accessibility issues. How do we get those people out of their homes, sharing their skills in a real world space. Does anybody have any ideas? Do we need to? That's a good question. I'll talk into this. Um, yeah, I, I trained artists, make stuff, paint stuff, mainly as a hobby now, because obviously train as an artist you're good for flipping burgers basically um, and I don't feel the urge to interact with people in the real world I can, I can do everything I like online I can post videos I can post photos I can interact with people you know the impact of the internet on the communities that I operate within in the last 20 years and the quality of the sort of stuff that people are producing has gone through the roof and that's because it's all been shared online it's a global community global competition sprung up, those sort of things. And it hasn't, you know, it, it has actually spawned, spawned real life meetup, but um, that's been possible mainly because it's just taken place online. So it is working its way back into the real world, I would argue, but do you need to in, in some way? Like, so for me, like this is um, really speaking kind of part of the, the overall thing of like, there are some maker spaces out there, mm -hmm. but coming back to what we hear about today, the net who he is, about the internet and how that's just creating connections for people who are makers anyway? Um, kind of going back to that idea of learning from people on YouTube, I think that's where I learn a lot of things. I love making books and book binding and I've learned so much of that by watching videos over and over again. Um, and then that also can translate into the real world, not necessarily in a makerspace, but in a more uh, very tight-knit way where I have my friend come and visit me and he goes, oh, you're making books? How do you do that? Can you teach me? Um, and also if you have something that's specialised and not everyone is interested in the internet, is amazing because you can see people from all over the world who are that one person from where they live who are doing that thing. Um, I think for maker spaces, the most important thing is potentially having access to those expensive pieces of equipment that you might not have. I um, used to be a jeweler, and once I finished my training and had to go out there and buy all my own equipment, it was almost impossible because I needed a space that was set up for me to be able to use fire <laughs> and um, hammers and anvils and all kinds of things, and that's a huge barrier to entry. Um, so there, uh, there's a small um, kind of almost, I guess, makerspace in, in that kind of way in Wellington called 
workspace and it's a little jewelry studio where you can come in and hire a bench or whichever. So I guess that's a version of a makerspace. Um, or in the discussion earlier, we were talking about 3D printers or um, a huge loom, maybe. Um, having access to that in a community space, I think, is really important because artists usually, or people who are um, makers, don't usually get access to a lot of money. You have to work a second job to be able to do the thing that you love. So having, being able to pull resources and have that available, I think, is really important. I've got a question for you guys from, from the library. Um, the make space thing's great, and I think this, what you've just said there about the, the actual technology and, and the cost of it and, and that being a magnet for, for communities to come together to do things is really important. But as a, as, as a library and a public resource, is this a bit of a response to the increasing digitization of your sort of stock trade, you know, the, the books, those sort of resources, and the fact that those can be available online, but, you know, potentially without all the, the, the need for those storage facilities for all that, those bits of paper? Is it, is it a way to sort of provide a new service to the community and bring the community get together in another way? Yes, so um, I'll answer that. I would stress that in my answer um, that this is my opinion. It's not necessarily council policy. Right? And I, w <laughs> I just want to say that so I still have a job next week. So <laughs> my opinion. So one of the things that certainly happened with libraries over the last 20 years is that increasing competition for people's time. So a lot of our reading used to be just books, and we were a repository for books, a storehouse where that information and knowledge could be shared. Now people are just sourcing their information from their pocket um, all the time. So our relevance is different. Um, we do still have an awful lot of books, and we do still have an awful lot of use of those books, but um, we are still a big community cultural facility um, designed around the sharing of knowledge. So as people's um, knowledge needs change, that's part of our response is, yes, okay, so um, you're a jeweler, you'd like to do more jewelry making, but of course you can't have all the equipment and you're not gonna be doing that all the time. So your equipment, if you had it, would be sitting in the space being unused. So why not let the community own that equipment and you can come in and use it? That's part of the philosophy. But Or the act of jewellery making or sewing or art making or whatever else, pottery, it becomes a luxury that only the rich can afford. And I don't think that's fair because I think that there are so many people who not only get skills out of it, but get joy out of it. And I think that's just as important as getting, you know, a marketable skill. And then otherwise people, you know, people who might not have done well, as you say, in the, the um, sports or the cultural aspects of school or the traditional exam, you know, knowledge-based thing, they might
it's fine where it is, and it's just nice to hold. And you don't have to worry about dropping it at a pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, does anyone have any other comments about how to en engage people in making? I think it's important um, to recognize that people will have different comfort levels in, in public. Um, I was part of a tool library um, in back in Canada, um, and we tried to make it um, really accessible to people, not that many young blonde women in their 20s are interested in woodworking, but there's a lot of <laughs> older gentlemen who are, who feel like they have a lot to tell me that I didn't want to know. <laughs> um, and so while I accept that it's very helpful of them, um, kind of not making it patronizing to new people who are trying to explore something um, and doing that in a delicate way, I think is, is super important because um, people will come in at different levels of experience, but also levels of comfort with uh, everyone else who's around them. I think that's why the using the internet as a resource to learn is so popular. And I also think that the internet is a great way to actually to learn by yourself but it's also a fantastic way to connect people to maker spaces or to opportunities to actually interact in real life. And you even knowing that this exists, you know, might make you um, curious to maybe meet other people. So there are a lot of um, um, work and workshops, we weekend workshops, <laughs> you know what I mean, or conferences or so that touch on certain aspects of particular crafts or arts or uh, making and um, I learn about them on the internet you know just so I guess what we've kind of touched on a bit um, and what's been quite interesting really and this is something that I kind of um, grapple with with a little bit as well in terms of creating a space that people are going to utilise is that the people here who are makers, you have an inherent motivation because of the passion you have for what you make to research and find out more about that particular craft or skill. Um, and I come across this a lot too as well with, um, you know, we can hold one wānanga for Taonga portal and we'll get people from Bluff to Kati Kati coming to it because they have this inherent motivation, they want to know more and they're willing to travel and go to whatever lengths to, f to get that knowledge. Um, so I guess, you know, how do we create or foster a space, whether it be an online space um, that's as diverse as possible to really motivate makers to want to come in and engage? Do we have to remain really specialised? Is there crossover skills we can kind of put people together? It sounds to me um, like the possibly the more diverse the making space is, the more amazing it could be to be there and, and to have um, people's skills and knowledge cross-pollinate, like you were talking about before, that um, you go do something else and it you know, you share knowledge and you can, it just adds to the whole creative process. But I think also what the question you were just asking is making me think about personal safety. So, and you want that whether you're in a physical space with other people or online. You know, and a lot of online forums will have their sort of little code of conduct and that, you know, we don't accept this kind of behaviour and da 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 da. And I guess um, that needs to be, I guess, spoken about and um, that information disseminated in a maker space so that people know that, you know, maybe they want to just come in and do their thing and it's enough for themselves just to be in the presence of other people who are creating and that just feels nice. Or maybe you want to come and really get into what someone else is doing and, you know, because like, we are all different and like, you have 
different levels of coping in social situations. So yeah, it's this that safety, that personal safety factor, I think, making it attractive. You know, I think about that for myself. Like I don't go to social things and do stuff. Um, I can psych myself up for this, but but not to go and be part of an art group or something, you know? I don't want to do that with a group of people. So yeah, safety. So I grew up in Whanganui, and um, they've got a really great community education service there. So all of my childhood, I remember every school holiday or every you know weekend program would be filled with um, either cheap or free classes that they would run for kids, you know, and they would be for kids of eight to twelve or something like that, doing printmaking, doing pottery, doing um, all of these different maker activities and so I think that's really one of the major things that you've got to try and encourage it at the children's level so that kids can get into it and so that kids can experiment without feeling like they have to do something perfectly the first time as well. So just going back to your comment about feeling safe, sorry, just coming back to that. Um, do you think that if you had engaged with a community of makers online in a, in a sharing social sense, that would make you feel more comfortable going to a real world event where those makers were present? Probably not. But see, that's just me personally, yeah. Just add my perspective on that. Like 20 years of using discussion boards and some of the things that I've done over the years. And I've got people who I've never even met in a physical world who I consider to be some of my best friends, like three, three people who I'm in touch with on an almost daily basis. Um, that sounds weird, but, <laughs> but that, that's the way it is. And we, we share all our stuff backwards and forwards and we have these communications. One day, hopefully, we'll, mi we'll meet up and have some beers. We keep threatening to do it, but... Um, Maybe that won't happen. I fundamentally believe that it's those online communities are great. You, you can build those and then people, when they feel comfortable with, or they've met somebody in those online communities that they've got some commonality with, to actually then meet up in a, in a physical space and, and sort of share, share what they've done one-to-one -one is, is, is awesome, I think. So it's definite, definitely for them. Does anyone else have any comments around relationships? Um, I think maybe it helps with a space like that if you start at a really grass, grassroots level and think about making a kind of uh, a vibe <laughs> or whichever where people feel like there is something that they can identify with with the space because I think a, a space full of tools is a little intimidating if you don't know how to use them or you um, feel like you're just going to rock on up there into this empty room and not know what to do. So having people there who are enthusiastic and friendly, who can help teach you um, and give an energy to the space, I think is really important. And that spreads, once that starts going, it could continue throughout the community and spread word of mouth style. So I think that's potentially one way to activate a space. I've just got this um, question in my head that um, it, it's kind of come from, from the work I do with, with kids, but it, it's applicable to the community. Like, how do we encourage people that are not makers at the moment to realise that they can be makers and if there's something they're really interested in, perhaps they could um, become a maker in that field or in that thing and, um, and create things for themselves? Anyone got any ideas? Probably just definitely getting in there when it comes to both organisations, so within, so if you have like a community notice board, but also a good thing would be to start from a young age because there, we still have that very traditional centric view that like sports and cultural groups only start at school and a lot of people when they do extracurricular stuff don't change from when they started at school. So 
as much as it is cool and all, but like doing rugby from school for your entire life, that's because you started doing it at school. It's not because you really picked up on it. And I, I imagine it's a big problem if you want to start a new group, you don't know where to start and you don't know where to go. And so online forums and stuff like that are basically enablers of community vibrance because you can give that option to find online. So the best place to start with would be community sites, would be city council, or even just from the workplace and starting from like schools. Um, I think that uh, I kind of had a reaction to what you said because I teach uh, design students at university and I don't think that they do that either though. So they've come to design school and they want to be designers or makers or artists or whatever and they don't have the confidence to make, um, which is which sucks. <laughs> Um, and I think it also goes back to what you were talking about, where um, in high schools, and I think primary school is a little bit better for this, but in high school you're so focused on a certain type of education and a certain thing that is isn't important or valued, and it is often rugby or sports or getting into university. And when I was in high school, they did a fundraising event and the, my art teacher said, you should be involved, we'll get some money so that we can use in our art room. And then all the money went to the rugby team and it was really disheartening and it feels like when you're in high school and you're interested in making and uh, all of those kinds of things, you get a lot of messages that you shouldn't be doing that. So I think um, getting high schools more involved I think is really important so it doesn't get beaten out of the kids. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's an element of people don't know what they don't know um, and they need to have been exposed to the sort of technologies and, uh, and design amenities that are, that are potential potentially out there and to do that you obviously need people who know how to use them you need the facilities and the equipment in the first first place it just takes people to invest time and effort and money into it I think um, it's important like a 3D, I bought a 3D printer last week it's fantastic. I never used a 3D printer before in my life. I just thought, all right, AliExpress, 350 bucks delivered. I'm having one of those. It took me an hour to screw it together. The thing came in about four bits with 20 screws. I shoved the 50 grams of filament in it and I sparked it up and I went, right, what do I do now? Oh, Thingiverse, open resource of freely downloadable 3D objects. Bosh, I'll have that. TIE Fighter for the boy. Ping, on it went. Three hours later, brilliant it's absolutely perfect thing and the boy saw this and he immediately went right where's the 3d design software give me that ipad i want to, i want to make a spaceship and then so he's off on on the ipad making stuff already he's nine and i'm like right i'm gonna have to buy him a pc now and, and, and get in <laughs> get get in some proper software because he's not making mickey mouse stuff out of an ipad so um I, it, once people are exposed and they see the potential of what can be done with it, I mean those those things are so useful for DIY at home. You need you need a piece of plumbing part that you you can't find in the shop. You can design it and make it in a few minutes. You know if you know how to use a 3D application, which is built into Windows now. So um, the more people are exposed to this, and definitely at school for sure, um, running that sort of stuff at lunch times, opening spaces up so that so that kids can get into them and actually use them without any fear of being told off, you can't use that, you can't do this, you can't do that. I think it's really important. Awesome. Hey, thank you all so much. We've sort of come to the end now, but I want to just um, do a couple of takeaways. I've been listening to you all really intently and what you said at the beginning of the session a Makerspace was. But as we went through the discussion, the things that really came out was that it's about encouraging people that they can be makers. It's about enabling them to make things, whether that's through sharing knowledge or providing the equipment. It's about the friendships that you build, whether those be online friendships or real world friendships. It's about starting early, getting children involved, getting them making things with their hands so they feel confident to engage as makers in their adult life. It's about creating a safe space where people of any ability, age, gender, feel like they can come and be safe and make. Uh, it's about accessibility for everybody. 
and it's about diversity of what you're offering to appeal to as many people as possible. Do we think that kind of sums it up? Awesome. So are there any, um, just very, very quickly, any takeaways that people are going to take from this discussion and maybe put into action? So one of the things that came up, oh, Leith's got one. This is a public service announcement. <laughs> um, so it would be wonderful if some of you can generate some big ideas to go up on the big ideas board. Do talk to Gina and to Duncan about that. Um, because I think there are amazing ideas, but how do we not go away from here and just do nothing? What can we practically do? I know that's a huge challenge, but that's the end of the public service announcement. Thank you. Thanks, Leith. So the two takeaways that I'm going to take from this, the two things that I'm going to put into action right away. The first one is, anytime I watch a make a video online and I learn from that video, I'm going to put a comment up just really encouraging that person and saying, hey, thanks for that video, that was really awesome, I really appreciate that you did that, I've learned a lot, you're great. Because I think that really encourages people to keep making and sharing and then those people might tell other makers they know, hey, you really gotta do this, I get lots of positive feedback and it makes me feel good. So we can all do that, that's a really cool thing. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at how can I facilitate amazing makers that I know to share their knowledge online can I take my phone down or my tablet and record them and put it up? Can we get the kids in school as a little assignment to make a, make a video to share um, so that we're encouraging people to share their knowledge and also developing those skills about how to share knowledge as well in a digital space. So those are my two takeaways. I wanna thank you all so much for coming and sharing. I really appreciate it, I've learned a lot and um, I hope you all have a fabulous rest of your day. Likewise, thank you, enjoy the day. Oh, and your things that you've made, bring them up if you don't want to keep them.